Okay, we're going to uh, carry on where we left off yesterday. And yesterday we were looking at uh, a couple of different motor configurations. And today I want to do the third worksheet. Here we have a 600 volt three phase motor bank. All taps are between 3 and 7.5 meters. So our tap conductors are between 3 and 7.5 meters. Our equipment termination temperature rating is 75 degrees. And we want to go through and solve for pretty much everything, including our branch circuit conductors. We want to solve for our overloads and then of course the overcurrent device, the branch circuit overcurrent device. We want to look at the size of the tap conductors, the feeder conductor, and then also of course our main overcurrent device. So uh, step number one, we're going to uh, start by uh, looking at all of our full load currents. So we have to go through and calculate or more appropriately cal uh, figure out rather what our, our full load currents are in each motor. So we have the very first one is a 7.5 horsepower motor. And that, of course, now we're going to go to table 44 and we can start putting in some of the full load current ratings. So if we go to table 44, like I said, they have that nice column in this code book where you don't have to do any math. You just simply go to the 600 volt column and uh, we can write down some currents. So here we have 9 amps. For our 10 horsepower, we have 11 amps. For our 5 horsepower, 6.1 amps. For our 25 horsepower, we have 27 amps. Now, for our 3.5 kilowatt, now this is where we don't actually get to use table 44. So we're going to actually have to do a little bit of math here. Who could recall what the formula is to solve for current given three phase and we're dealing with power in the form of kilowatts? What's our formula? Holy cow. I got 15 fourth periods and nobody can recall the formula for finding current. Current is equal to? P divided by what? Three. There we go. <laughs> Root three times V line. So here we're going to use 3,500 and we're going to divide that by root three times 600. And that should give us 4.2 amps. And so that's how you do that. Has anybody ever dealt with an IEC motor in industry? Nobody? Yeah, you have? And how big was it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, like three amps. Okay, so it was something like this. We weren't dealing with uh, with, with like a, no. a, a huge motor. No. Okay, good. I, I don't think there's a lot of them out there, but I think we're going to start seeing more of them as uh, more and more of the product that's being made now in industry is from Europe. And so for sure we're going to see that at some point. Let me see how uh, get rid of that. I'm Oh, I forgot power factor. Thank you. Who said that? Right on. All right, Cody, you get extra marks here. Yes. Because by rights, what do we really need to be solving for here? Is it P we're interested in or S? Or is there a current based on P or S? It's based on S, right? In other words, this motor is not purely resistive, so we have to actually solve for S. And so if I back up here a little bit, um, we could actually either apply it in here or uh, to sort of get 4.2, let's do this. Let's get rid of that and we'll put it in here so we have 600 times 0.8. Thank you, Cody. And that should give you 4.2. So 4.2 is the right number. I just forgot to add that in there. Power factor, right? So current is based on S, not on P. All right, so that's how we got 4.2. Thank you for that. Good. And so we can actually put that now up here as 4.2 amps. And 
Lastly, we have a 20 horsepower motor, which is 22 amps. Does everybody get that? Is that, I mean, 4.2, I think I did it a couple times in the office to make sure. Is that what everybody's getting? 4.2, good. Okay. So now that, that's where we start. So we need to know those numbers because a lot of what we do, of course, is going to be off of the full load currents of each motor. So let's now go to looking at uh, determining the branch circuit conductors. Last motor, 22 amps. Yeah. So we're going to look at the branch circuit conductors. So, branch circuit conductors is going to be based on now, do we have continuous duty motors across the board here? Okay, and that's what you guys have to always be looking for. And this is kind of a more realistic situation what you might run into. Not everything's always going to be continuous duty. And so, there's a couple of, of uh, places we're going to look in the code book. If you look at rule 28, 106, sub rule 2. Okay, that's going to tell us how we deal with non-continuous duty motors. All right, it should tell you a little bit about table 27. Okay, table 27 is going to give us some derating values uh, as far as how we select our branch circuit conductors. And uh, of course later on then of course we're always we're also going to have to uh, look at some overcurrent devices. But as far as branch circuit conductors are concerned, to determine the ampacity of our branch circuits, we're going to have to use table 27 where we're dealing with non-continuous duty. So let's start with the very first motor and that's a continuous duty motor. So motor one is nine amps. And then based on uh, the 28, uh, 106, one, we're simply going to take that times 125%. It's a pretty standard calculation, which gives us 11.25 amps. Now we're going to go to table two. And based on the fact that we have a termination temperature rating of uh, 75 degrees, that's going to equal a number 14. Now, the next motor is a non-continuous duty motor. Say we're, we're talking short time duty, 15 minutes. So we're going to take that 11 amps and we're going to take that to table 27. Table 27 is going to tell us how we, what multiplying constant rather we're going to use to size our conductor here. And if you look at short time duty, 15 minutes, should give you uh, uh, 1.2 or 20% uh, increase. So 120% in total. So we take 100%, which is 11 amps, times it by 1.2, and we should get 13.2 amps. Again, we take that to table two, and that also is going to equal a number 14. Okay, so great question. So he's asking, what is that junction box in motor two all about? I'm so glad you asked because at this point, I want you guys to look at rule 28104. Okay, so we're gonna for this one, we're gonna look at 28104 and sub rule two. What class of motor are we dealing with here? And this is a very realistic situation if we're in a boiler room or something like that. Class H, do you guys recall from last year how we deal with class H motors? Okay, so now this is where we actually went to, and this is only for determining the insulation rating on the wire. Now we've just selected the ampacity based on the 75 degree column of table two. If you look at rule 28, uh, 104, it actually tells us to do that. So we go to the table, table 37, and we determine what class of motor it is and what the temperature rating on the insulation has to be. What does it tell us the temperature rating is going to be? 110 degrees. 
Now, the rule itself, 28104, simply says that when we size the ampacity, we do that out of the 75 degree column of tables one to four. In this case, again, we're assuming copper, and so we're doing table two. So we've sized the ampacity correctly, but when you and I walk into the wholesalers to buy wire, what insulation are we going to ask for? 110 degrees. Okay? So now you'll also notice the rule 28104 says that we don't have to have that in the entire run. The intent of that junction box to answer your question is very simple. When you go to buy 110 degree wire, do you think it's cheap? No, it's expensive. So does it stand to reason that I don't want to have to run expensive wire for 30 meters? Okay, so there's two, there's two things that happen here. Number one, it helps us save some money by putting a junction box here because the rule simply says that if it's under 100 horsepower, which is the case here, we physically have to have that junction box at minimum of 600 millimeters away, and the length of the wire can't be any more, or can't be any less, rather, than 1.2 meters. The reason being is when you hook it up to a motor, a Class H motor, that wire actually acts like a heat sink. And you guys learned all about heat sinks in electronics. So what's the purpose of a heat sink? Dissipate heat. So if the purpose is to dissipate heat, and engineering has showed us that those wires will actually heat up, because it's acting like a heat sink, is it standard reason that we want a wire that can get rid of the heat easily? Hence the 110 degree insulation rating on the wire. Okay? So does that make sense as to why the junction box is there? I mean, two things. A, we need it's acting like a heat sink. B, we just don't want to buy a whole bunch of expensive wire if we don't have to. Right? And you go to table 19 if you want to find the different types of wires that will actually give you. Uh, 110 degrees or more. A TEW, I believe, is one of them. You guys probably did an example like this in third period last year. So yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Riley, because I did meant I did want to actually mention that on this particular note and was about to forget. So I'm glad you asked. Any questions? Any more questions on the junction box there? Okay, good. So I never did finish. This was table. 37 there that we would reference in order to figure out the class H. So ampacity hasn't changed. We just have to make sure when we go to buy our wire, it's a 110 degree wire for that first 1.2 meters. And then after the 1.2 meters, does it matter what uh, insulation rating I have? It's probably going to buy 75 or 90 degree, whatever is readily available. Usually it's RW90X link, something like that, right? So do that. So good. Next one, six point. Oh, let's go back to black here. Keep it consistent. So six point one amps on the next motor, and it looks like it's a continuous duty motor. So we're going to times it by one point two five, and that gives us seven point six two five amps, which is going to yield us a number fourteen again. The next motor, 27 amps, again, times 1.25, 33 33.75 amps, and when we go to table 2, that is going to give us a number 10. 4.2 amps. Now that one, of course, is a uh, not a continuous duty. It's an intermittent duty five minutes. So now we're back to table 27 to determine what our derating value is. And if we've done that correctly, I believe it's 0.85. So that actually gives us 3.57 amps, which again is a number 14. And lastly, we have a, a continuous duty motor on the last one, 22 amps times 1.25 is 27.5 amps, and that is a number 10. Now, are we going to run into a problem selecting these size of wires 
based on Rule 14104. Does everybody remember 14104? It says that we can't put any more than a 30 amp over current device on a number 10. Are we going to run into a problem here dealing with, no, we're not, because we're dealing with motors. As soon as we're in motors, this is a specific section of the code book that supersedes the general rules. General rules, uh, section 14, of course, falls in the general rules. And so here, this supersedes it because we are dealing with a specific load. Transformers are similar, same with capacitors. It has its own specific rule that addresses that. And you can find in, in section 14, it even says that if there are other rules in this code book that address it, you go by those rules. Okay, so let's now look at, we're going to just go back and maybe place some numbers in here. Uh, so in this uh, case, we said this was a number 14. This was a 14. 14. 10. 14 and 10. And that's our wire sizes that we have for those motors. <clears throat> Now, let's go and look at, next, our overcurrent devices for each one of these. Now, as you will notice, we don't have all breakers or all fuses. We have a combination of both. So, as far as the branch circuit overcurrent is device, or device is concerned, rather, we have to look at each individual one. So, let's start with the first one. What table are we going to reference to determine what our overcurrent device is going to be? 29. So if we go to table 29, the first one's a fuse. And this is a continuous duty motor. Again, we're assuming squirrel cage. So it should give us 300%, which really means times 3, which is 27 amps. We then go to table 13 and we are simply going to use that as a catalog. We do not, we cannot supersede or exceed rather 27 amps. So what kind of overcurrent device are we going to put here? A 25 amp. Now in this case we're dealing with a uh, fuse, so we're going to put a 25 amp fuse in there. Do you use the full load amps? Say that again. So to figure out our overcurrent, do you use 9 amps, not the 11.25? That is correct, because it's, it's, the full, it's the full load current. Yep, full load current. Good question. So unlike a regular load, when, you, when we are sizing a regular load, you guys, it's based on the ampass of the wire normally, right? The overload. Uh, overload is full load current, you bet. And when in doubt, how do we know? Where do we go to find out when in doubt? Go to the rule. The rule will tell you. It says take full load current and multiply it by the values of table 29. Same with overloads. It will tell you to take the full load current, multiply it based on the service factor of either 1.25 or, or 1.15. Okay. So 11 amps is our next motor. That's the full load current. We multiply that. This is a breaker in this case based on table 29, which is... 27.5 amps. Again, we go to table 13, and that should yield us, again, a 25 amp, in this case, breaker. Our full load current of the next motor, 6.1 amps, multiplied by a fuse rating of 3 based on table 29. That gives us 18.3. And that will give us a 15 amp fuse. Next, we have 27 amps. And this is a breaker times 2.5 is 67.5 amps. I'm going to skip the fact you guys should know it's table 13 by now. And that's going to equal a 60 amp breaker. Then back to our IEC motor, 4.2. And this is a fuse times 3 is 12.6 amps. Now, when we go to table 13, 
the rule says we can't go past a calculated value. Is there some other rule in the code book that might tell us otherwise? 28200B. Good. Thank you. 28200B. Hey, if you guys go to the rule, 28200B, what does it say there, Randy? Uh, no record device having a minimum rating or setting of 50 m shall be permitted in your value to the value specified in table 29. Perfect. So, in English, really, it's saying that even though the calculated value is less than 15 amps, a 15 amp over current device is going to be considered adequate and protecting of that particular um, of, of that particular load. Lastly, we have 22 amps, and that looks like that's what's our multiplying constant here? 2.5, 1.5. A lot of students miss this. What kind of motor do we have here? Good. We have one rotor motor. So table 29 says only 1.5, which yields 33 amps, which means a 30 amp fuse. Okay, let's put some of these, go back up here and put these in here. So we have 25 amp. 25 amp, 15 amp, 60 amp, 15 amp, and 30 amp. And that's where we're at. Now that's for those individual uh, branch circuit over current devices. Now as you guys notice, we have two breakers and the rest are fuses. And the main overcurrent is a fuse, so we're going to have to come back and revisit both the breakers and calculate them as fuses when we go to do the main overcurrent. More to come on that. All right, so the next goal here is we want to determine the feeder conductor size. Okay, so if you guys go to rule 28, 108, 1C. That's going to talk to us a little bit about the process we're going to use to solve for this. That says we take the largest full load current. Multiply it by 125%. So our largest full load current is 27 amps. We're going to multiply that by 1.25. Then we're going to add to that the FLAs or the full load currents of all the other continuous duty motors. Now I just like to put this in brackets. You guys do what you want. It really doesn't matter. Uh, I just it, it helps show groupings is all it really does. So we have. 6.1 plus 9 plus 22. That's our continuous duty. I can see my computer isn't keeping up again. Seems like it. we get to this point. Let's see here. Control, shift, escape. What do we have running here that's causing a problem? Hmm. I don't see anything that is, okay. All right, and then we have to add to that our, now this is, this is the part that can get confusing. The values as calculated when we size the conductors for the non-continuous duty. So I'm going to put in brackets 13.2 plus. 3.57. Now I want to backtrack and show you where that's at. So when we went to do the branch circuit conductors, the values we're looking for are right here and right here. That's what the rule says. So we have to use the values as calculated in 28106. 
Okay, that's what that means when it in the rule when it talks to us about that. Now, if we've done that correctly, oops. That should equal a total of 87.62 amps. Now if we go to table two, that will equal a number three. All right, now let's look at our tap conductor size. If we if you look at rule 28-110 2B All right, that tells us that because we're between 3 and 7.5 meters, we can't be less than one-third that of the larger conductor. Now, what I should have done, I'm just going to go up here. I'm going to do this. We need to know that number, don't we, for this next calculation? Yeah. All right, so what we have to do, we can't be less than a third. So we have to take 100 amps, pretty basic math, divide that by 3, and that gives us 33.33 repeating. We can't be less than that. If we go to table 2, of course that tells us that that equals a number 10. Now, here's a tip, you guys. When you're doing this, we can't be any less than a number 10. But what if one of these motors had a branch circuit conductor that was bigger than a number 10? Which one do we select? Number 10 or the branch circuit conductor size? The branch circuit conductor size. I've seen students automatically stick this answer in when they have a question and it, you, know, you have four or five motors and one of them actually has a bigger branch circuit conductor and then the student misses that. They get that particular one wrong on the exam. So just make sure that you've gone back to your branch circuit conductor sizes and make sure that you're not missing out on one of those that's actually bigger than this. This just says this has to be a minimum of a number 10. Doesn't mean to say it can't be bigger. Okay? So that's your tap conductor size. <clears throat> now, I'm going to just try something here because I noticed my computer is either not keeping up, but I'm going to actually do this. We're going to insert the blank page and see if that helps. I'm just wondering maybe if by the time we extend the pages all the way down, we're running into a problem there, and that's why I can't keep up. So the next thing we want to do is we want to look at uh, the size of the main fuse. So our main overcurrent device. Yeah, I think that's it, because this seems to be Right on par, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so what's the first thing we have to do if we want to size the main overcurrent device? Good. Thanks, Brian. We need to turn the other into breakers. So if we go back to our drawing here, you'll notice that we have a breaker here and we have a breaker here. Now the rule says that we take the largest calculated value, and I pointed this out yesterday. We don't take the largest overcurrent value, the device value here, we actually take its calculated value. Now the problem we have is we're not dealing with all fuses, so we have to go back and do a calculation here for the two breakers in order to figure that out. So that's motor two and motor four. So let's go back over here. So we now have to look at motor 2 and we have to treat it like it actually has a fuse. So that 10 horsepower, that had an 11 amp full load current rating. And if we're going to treat it like a fuse, we have to go back to table 29 and multiply that by 3, which gives us 33 amps, which equals a 30 amp fuse. 
Okay, now that one isn't the one we're really concerned with. I'm just kind of going through the motions here, guys, because that's only 11 amp on its full load current. The one we're most interested in is the 25 horsepower motor, which is motor four, I believe. Is it motor four? Yeah, motor four. And it has the largest FLA, 27 amps. But because we have to convert that to a fuse, we have to convert that by timesing it by three. That gives us 81 amps. Now that would mean that we would put an 80 amp fuse in. However, the rule says that we have to use the calculated value. Here is our calculated value. All right, so when we go to do the fuse, here's how it plays out. We're going to take 81 amps and add to that the full load current ratings of all the other motors. So we have 9 amps plus 11 amps plus 6.1 plus 4.2 plus 22 amps. And that gives us 133.3 amps. And based on table 2, or table 2 rather, table 13, we know we can't exceed that number. And so what number are we going to pick for an overcurrent device for a main? Good, 125. Okay, questions? Good. Okay, so you can see this is an important step. If you don't convert that to fuses, you're going to get the answer wrong. And it's not because you didn't select the right motor to use in your calculation. You selected the wrong number because you didn't convert it to a fuse first. Where's the rule that says that number? We just make this stuff up, man, as we go along. Um, i got to be honest, off the top, I don't know if I could just say, here's the rule that comes right out and says it. For now, I'm going to have to just go with that old, uh, trust me, this is the way we do it, and I'll come back to you after class with the rule. Because there is something in here that talks to us about that, I just don't have it on off the top. It's the same as like that leading this time here. Yep, then you change them all to breakers. Yeah. Well, I mean, you change them all to breakers because it depends on the type of motor. You notice that when we were looking at uh, wound rotor motors, you know, that's a different multiplying. So you have to be careful there. You can't just go by the largest FLA. If I have any advice for you guys, you notice I did a calculation here with motor two. I mean, we know that that doesn't have the biggest FLA, and I mean, I already knew how it was going to play out, but what happens if there's a multiplying constant that gives us a bigger number versus this one, right? So that's why if, if, if I give you guys any advice, go through the process. Complete your due diligence to make sure that you're not missing something, okay? It's easy to miss one little calculation, and you guys all know that a lot of these questions are cascading, right? You get the first one wrong, now you get the second one wrong and the third one wrong. You can lose a lot of marks. But I will, I will come, you know, uh, I don't have that rule off the cuff, but I know there's something in there that tells us about that. I just don't know right now. So I'll talk to you after class. I'll find it. Maybe talk to you in lab. Probably mention it to everybody in line because I'm sure everybody's asked where does it say that. So I'll find it and let you know. So a couple more things we have to calculate, you guys. One of them is uh, the size of the conductor from the motor to controller. Now, in order to do that, we're going to reference rule 28.112.1a. Subrule 1, item A. It talks to us about how we're going to do that. And it, it's actually quite simple. It simply says take the full load current, in this case, which uh, the secondary full load current that is. Now you'll notice on your drawing it says secondary rated for 50 amps. So you need to know what the secondary conductor is rated for. So we're going to take 50 amps 
and we're going to multiply that by 125%, which gives us 62.5 amps, and that will yield us a number six. All right, now the last one is we need to know the conductor from the controller to the resistor bank. And that rule is right underneath the one we just referenced. That's 28.112.2, subrule 2. And it says we have to reference table 28. Okay, so how long, you guys, those resistors are actually put into that circuit? And it's usually via uh, a timing relay. So remember, a wound rotor motor has the ability to give us a lot of starting torque on startup. That's one of the characteristics of that motor. And, and wound rotor motors are expensive, but they are tailored to a specific load. And it's usually a load that's high inertia. In other words, something that requires a lot of torque to get it rolling off the get-go. And so in order to give us more torque and a reduced starting current, we can buy a wound rotor motor with a property size resistor bank. How long those resistors are put into the start circuit is dependent usually upon the timing relays. And those timing relays are often just manufactured for a certain time. Some of them are actually adjustable. Okay? And so what we have to get out of this is when you actually buy it, this is actually say, saying heavy starting duty. So that's an important piece of information when we take table 28. And table 28 says to us, so again, we take the full load secondary current and we multiply that by the derating factor of point. Four or five. So you can see it's actually taking the 50 amps and saying, hey, the resistors are only going to be in the circuit for a short period. Even though it's heavy starting unit, there's going to be a lot of current for a short period of time here. So these conductors really aren't going to get much of a chance to heat up. So we can make the conductor smaller for the, you know, for the few seconds that this conductor is going to be in the circuit. And so when we do that, we get 22.5 amps. And again, we go to table two, and that gives us a number 12. But I have a question. We're hooking up to a resistor bank. Is it going to be important when we buy the wire that we buy a particular insulation rating? Good, 90 degrees, you bet. In other words, if you remember that rule, it's 26642. It talks about resistive devices, and it's, it's more specific towards uh, motors and controllers. That rule tells us that when we go to buy the wire, we're going to buy a number 12, but it has to be a minimum of 90 degrees Celsius. So remember, those resistors are any element, you guys, anything that's an element heats up, it's going to act, it's going to create those conductors to heat up a little bit. So again, we need a conductor that has the ability to dissipate heat effectively. And so they say, hey, we need a 90 degree conductor for that. Has anybody ever replaced one an old light bulb, like one of those old 100 watt light bulbs in one of the old porcelain bases in an old house or something? When you pulled it down, what did the insulation look like in the junction box? It was cloth. Was any of it griddle? Yeah. Yeah. You know why that is? Partially heat from the light bulb, and of course that heat from the light bulb transfers up to conductors, and the wire in those days was not meant to handle that kind of heat. So this is where this is stemming from. Okay. Now again, most of those lights were on for you know 20, 30 years, and and all those lights are just heaters that produce light. Right. So unlike our nice LED bulbs that we have today, that hardly have any. Okay, any questions on what we just talked about here on that motor bank? That's a fairly extensive motor bank. Now, the journeyman, you guys should be able to go out into industry and, and uh, quite honestly, uh, 
properly size 